All right. Discord messages. Hmm. This can only end well. From Red Redacted. Are you okay with NSFW? Oh, well, it depends on the context. My character is always nude, but keeps a dog costume on hand. The dog costume is two pairs of socks, which are black and white with spots like a Dalmatian, which go on his ears and hands, and gloves that go on his feet, a Dalmatian dog tail bottom plug, and a red latex dog collar with a giant bone with his name, Joshua Smith, etched into it. He would basically be completely nude, except for wearing the things I mentioned in the previous sentence. Yeah, I can't say that that would be allowed in my games specifically, especially for what I'm considering doing as the premise. Which is, please, let me do this. Are you free for a one-on-one -on -one campaign with me? Make it completely NSFW. You know, I know that the real horror story here is the dog outfit that was just described and is now etched in my brain. But, you know, the actual horror story is, one, the basic name of Joshua Smith, and two, the spoiled attitude of expecting a DM to drop everything for you so they can run your furry campaign. Not exactly ideal. I'm running a campaign for a group of friends and family. We completed the Lost Mines and started Storm King's Thunder. Our bard has a plus 10 to persuasion, and when things don't go their way, the youth conjure animals and summons eight wolves or raptors. I'm sure some of you know what comes next. The first couple times, I was like, okay, whatever, but after it became their go-to move, it started getting really annoying. So they end up challenging Chief Guh to a 1v1. I draw up a simple round arena for them to fight in and tell the players that there is only one entrance and exit to the arena they are fighting in and is surrounded by all of the creatures that call Grud Hog Home. On their first turn, they summon eight wolves. And when Chief Guh goes to call in reinforcements of her own, the player hollers out that she is being dishonorable by calling minions to help in their duel. So I say, Okay, but if you summon any other creatures, she will call for help on her own because 9v1 is not a duel. God then proceeds to eat a few wolves, regaining some health. At this point, the player decides that they no longer want to fight and spend the next 30 minutes trying to convince me that they escaped by various means. They tried summoning eight pteranodons, using seven as a distraction and one to fly away, but they were knocked out of the air by rocks being thrown by the onlookers. Then it was, I summon eight giant toads and climb into the mouth of one. In the confusion, the toad will spit him out. He immediately casts invisibility and is able to escape. My response was, Okay, let's see you manage to make it through a small army and out of the arena. You are still in the middle of the Hill Giant Stronghold. Like I said, this went on for a while before I told them, Chief Guh wants you to surrender, and you will become a prisoner, and she will spare you. After another 20 minutes of out-of-game debating, they finally accept their fate. I feel kind of bad for doing this. I don't want to ruin the player's experience, but you could tell that the party was getting really annoyed also. Am I in the wrong? They technically did nothing wrong, but the way they were playing was ruining the session for everyone else. And also, I feel I should clarify a few things. Number one, the player in question is neither a child nor a teenager. Number two, I allowed them to attempt to escape three times before shooting them down. Number three, before casting the spell, they always said, I'm going to do something cheeky. <laughs> Number four, I misspoke when I said I punished them for using the spell. I guess the imprisonment was really caused by the chief thinking that they were cheating, as they were thinking that they would walk away from this encounter with no repercussions. And number five, yes, I did speak with them after the session. This post wasn't meant to bash them, but to get other DMs' opinions on how it was handled. I do appreciate everyone for taking the time to respond. This is a rare occurrence, a somewhat horror story posted in the big D&D subreddit, and it was kind of framed as am I the a-hole, so let's do that thing. Not the a-hole! First and foremost, the player, and I guess the DM, but the player isn't using that spell right. Apparently, I didn't know this, the DM chooses the specific creatures that are summoned by the Conjure Woodland Beast spell, which is neat to know. But other than that, 
the player is put in a situation where they can't solve the problem with this one specific spell. I think this is great habit for DMs. You know, sometimes you throw some different scenarios at your players that can't be solved by abusing the same thing over and over and over again. This isn't just good inside of a TTRPG, it's good in every type of gaming scenario. In Destiny 2, for example, Bungie threw a boss at us called Rolk, the first disciple, who moves around the arena and is much less stationary, meaning that some strategies that are used by stationary players can't be used against Rolk. The DM pulled something similar and the player tried to butt their head against the wall anyway, and that is on them. Sometimes you gotta be more creative than just spamming the same spell over and over and over again. Oh, and on a personal note, seriously, I hate putting eight extra things on a battle map that just fill up the space. It just, ugh, it annoys the hell out of me. This happened during one of the many Dungeons & Dragons campaigns I've joined over the years. The cast is one, the DM, a high D&D veteran, and had a great campaign story and world. Myself as just a bland human fighter, that's all. A druid, a small gnomish bard who always talked like he was on shrooms. Paladin, a high and mighty symbol of justice who will smite all evil. And later, a party member. Wizard, nice, smart, but not involved too much, and Cleric, a standard red tiefling cleric of peace and harmony. Also a new player, added later in the campaign. The story starts when we're heading into a town to rest. Paladin wanted to visit the town church to ask for food and shelter. Alright, you enter in and see that it's a small place that also works as a local orphanage. As you see a tiefling in robes holding a book and- I draw my sword! State your reason for being here, demon, or get sent back to hell where you belong. Please put your weapon away. This is a place of worship, not violence, says the cleric. Oh my god! You're playing a pacifist cleric? Those suck! Paladin, it's cleric's choice on what her domain is. Paladin, again, had a character. She should have gone with life cleric to be a better healer at least. After a while, cleric joins the party. Why would she do that? Okay, racist paladin. I pledge my undying services to you. As you trek through your perilous adventures, I will use my shield to keep you and your friends safe. My magics will keep you alive. And although I may be put in grave danger myself, I know I shall have your noble and discriminatory blade beside me. Yeah, tiefling Like you're gonna do anything for us. Like, you're not even the right kind of healer. You didn't even pick the right spell. Anyway, yeah, Cleric joined the party with Paladin always insisting at making rolls at random to quote, see through her devilish lies, with DM and Cleric always telling him to stop and that there's nothing evil about her. Soon, we get a simple goblin ambush with Cleric giving us support with healing and protection spells while staying a bit away from combat. In the end, Paladin got hit hard as Cleric approached him. You look like you're hurt. Let me help starts to cast second level cure wounds. Get away from me, you demonic heathen. Your seduction won't work on a holy warrior of God. Proceeds to shove the cleric away. Dude, she's trying to help us. Yeah, dude, can you just get over your grudge with her? Well, druid, heal me instead. Okay, going out of character. I only went for combat spells. I wait for a long rest then. You're at half health. Are you sure you want to wait that long? Paladin said nothing as the DM went on with the story. Night Cleric decides to take Night Watch with Wizard, as Paladin decides to not sleep as he starts to follow Cleric around until she sat and began a prayer. While she's distracted, I draw my sword and impale her with smite. What? Paladin, I said no player versus player in session zero, and you're breaking the rules. It's not player versus player if she's not fighting back. That's... wow. Cleric at this point doesn't speak and her mic is voiceless with soft cries coming out. Paladin rolls despite DM saying he can't and gets max damage as he proclaims, Now you die, unholy spawn of evil! DM responds with Paladin as your sword impales her. A bright light shines from your blade as the smite is sent back to you. Your flesh starts to melt off, your head shrinks, and you explode into a pile of guts and blood as your holy god quickly resurrects Cleric as you have broken your sworn oath to your god for killing an innocent person. 
Paladin is quickly kicked from the game by DM. As Cleric stops crying for a bit as the rest of us apologize to her, DM says she can leave if she wants to, but she wants to keep playing, try again. She stays in our game until she left due to time scheduling. TLDR. Paladin kills our cleric for being a tiefling and gets killed like the baddies at the end of Raiders of the Lost Ark. That PvP line is, I believe, the longest I've ever laughed at a story. It's got some competition, but dang, that was funny. Look, though, the point is that, yeah, this behavior is really bad. Using roleplay as an excuse to bully other players is not cool. It's what my character would do is not great when used in this context as a way to make the game less fun. I actually recently encountered similar behavior, not in Dungeons & Dragons, but in Apex Legends, the Battle Royale video game of all things. If you're unaware, in this video game, you can play as various characters, and some of them, in the story and lore, really don't like each other. A random teammate I was with used that as an excuse to refuse to resurrect our fellow player, and use role-playing as the reason. And yeah, no matter how dedicated you are to your role-playing, no matter what game you're playing, doing that crap, it's not cool. I think the DM here handled this well. A hand-wavy explanation in-game, not letting anything go too far, and then a quick kick right out to the curb. With this kind of behavior, that's the sort of thing I love to see. Some minor backstory. I got my friends into Dungeons and Dragons back in high school playing 4th edition. Sorry, um, 4th edition. It was cringy and stupid, but we had fun. I had the books, so I DM'd for a bit until one friend, we'll call him Jack, wanted to take over the role. Fine by me, let me play an actual character for a bit. We'd eventually switch over to Pathfinder and then onto 5th edition. Those years were honestly great. We didn't have time to play often, but the games we did play, they were a blast. Fast forward a few years. Most of us are now in or finishing college and getting jobs. This is also now the era of online gaming, so even though we were busy with life stuff, we found time to play over Discord. Jack became the default dungeon master, because after going to college, he had fallen hard into tabletop role-playing games. And I mean hard. The guy ate, slept, and lived D&D, watching three different live streams, buying every book, running three, and playing in two games a week. His entire personality became D&D, which normally would be fine, but his obsession led to a lot of <clears throat> uh, problematic behaviors. For starters, our first 5th edition campaign was a modified Out of the Abyss game. Jack invited some of his friends from college to play with us. They were cool guys, but their characters had some big issues. They were playing a warlock and a sorcerer, both with big, chaotic, neutral, slash, borderline evil personalities. Meanwhile, the rest of us are playing pretty good characters who are just trying to survive the Underdark. The worst part is that from these two, Jack started to show his true side. See, Jack loves casters. Any character Jack makes is going to be the most optimized, know-it-all magic user you'll ever see, and this extends to when he dungeon masters. If you're a mage, suddenly you get the best loot falling from the sky. Tentacle rods, robes of- I'm sorry, tentacle rods. Robes of stars, wands of fireball, and all the bags of holding you'd need to carry that loot. Meanwhile, if you're a marshal, oh boy, I hope you enjoy a plus one short sword, though, and variance encumbrance rules. Yeah, he dropped those on us, randomly, meaning my strength seven ranger only had the ability to wear leather armor and carry a short bow. If I even tried to pick up that plus one short sword, I'd lose 10 feet of movement. Oh, uh, yeah, sorry. You should just probably note down that because Aragorn equipped that stuff, um, he's now uh, encumbered, and it looks like the heir to Gondor and legendary descendant of the Dúnedain, great ranger of the north, um, he has minus 10 to movement speed now. Well, it's not my fault. You're the one who equipped it. Speaking of that ranger I was playing, let's talk more about her. I had retired my original character for story reasons, but wanted a character that would fit better into the chaotic Underdark adventure we found ourselves in. So, seeing as Out of the Abyss is all about dealing with a demonic assault on the material plane, I made a halfling ranger who had escaped drow servitude and had learned to hunt the demons, plaguing the world in order to survive. I, of course, took fiends as a favored enemy, and we had a few encounters with them where I performed well. Unfortunately, as we started fighting more and more demons, I noticed that my spell, Fire Arrow, was basically useless, since most higher level demons are immune, or at least resistant to fire. 
I asked the dungeon master, Jack, if I could replace it. And since this was before spell swapping on level up was a rule, Jack said no. Well, next fight, there were some more demons, and I decided not to cast Fire Arrow and told the sorcerer that he should avoid fire spells too. And Jack called me out for metagaming? Yeah, the demon hunting ranger, who had fought non-stop demons for weeks, was told to not know the demons are fire resistant? Oh, and the metagame callouts don't end there. Morden Kanan's Tome of Foes had recently come out, and as a book collector, I picked up a copy. As soon as I mention getting it, Jack again says, You had better not look up those stat blocks. I don't want you cheating. A little later, we had a fight with an Alphishne, an interesting demon that I had actually heard of before. Not from a stat block, but from a Puffin Forest video. We collabed with him, link in the cards. Now, aside from most likely being resistant to fire, I only knew the thing's name. So when I saw the token, I said out loud, Oh, cool, an Alphishne. And Jack flipped out at me again for metagaming. But if we want to talk about metagaming, then Jack was the biggest offender of all. I ran one game with him as a player. Tales from the Yawning Portal had come out, so I wanted to run it as an adventure where the players could swap characters between dungeons or play the same ones all the way through. Jack rolled up a mystic. Now both the class and my DMing were new at the time, so... I didn't know better, never allowing a mystic at my table again. After the second dungeon, the party had acquired a decent amount of gold, and I told them since Waterdeep was the hub for the campaign, they could buy almost anything. Jack, of course, suggests that they all buy winged boots, and again, as a rookie DM, I allow it. So now all of the party can fly, being led by a class that can do anything, piloted by a guy who actually knows every stat block, cause he no life's this game and reads monster stat blocks for fun. It was years of dealing with so many problems from a guy who I thought was my friend, but just like his D&D playing, his friendship was also full of red flags, and eventually him and his girlfriend moved together, and somehow I and most of my friend group just stopped talking to him. I'm sorry this is long, but I've been telling stories about this guy for years to new players at my table, and Jack, hey, if you see this, good riddance. Man, metagaming is definitely something I would rather we avoid as D&D players and dungeon masters, but guess what? It is inevitable, it's going to happen, and some people take metagaming way, way, way too far. Not in the sense that people do it too much, in the sense that people get way too sensitive over it. I mean, seriously, a ranger knowing about fire resistance, that's not that big of a deal. Also, you can't expect experienced players are not going to know about some monsters, like the Nalfishne, especially monsters that get a lot of attention on YouTube. To play devil's advocate, you also can't stop DMs from reading stat blocks. I'll be real, I read stat blocks too. I don't have them all memorized, for the love of God, but I do read them. However, there are solutions to this, like reskinning, or using monsters from brand new pieces of material, like the Flea Mortals book I never shut up about. See, that kind of metagaming isn't a big deal. Jack's other problems? Yeah, not as easily cured. I've been playing Dungeons and Dragons since I was 10. My dad was an avid D&D player in his youth, and he passed that passion along to me. I've mostly DM'd, as most of the groups I've played with have been first-timers. And honestly, I don't mind that that much. I find DMing to be very rewarding. Because of this, back about six years ago in high school, I was approached by a group of my classmates looking to get into Dungeons and Dragons, and I happily agreed to DM for them. I should note now that all the players in the group are male, and I at the time considered myself female. I'm non-binary now, but that's not really relevant. But everything seemed to go okay. I was seen as one of the guys, and honestly, the group was a delight to DM for. They all had such unique characters and were willing to explore what I set down for them, so I thought I had found a good group to stick with long term. This changed after one of my players, henceforth known as the Dungeon Master, took over DMing from me. I was stoked to finally get the chance to play, so I rolled up my first player character. Galatia, a winged tiefling paladin who had made an oath under duress and felt weighed down by her responsibilities. Edgy, I know, I was 15. I really enjoyed playing her, until she started getting special attention for being the Goral character. People hitting on her in taverns, getting told by blacksmiths she should try something lighter when she went to buy warhammers, despite her being described as buff, constantly grumpy looking tough girl type. This even went so far as the DM rolling charisma for a random NPC and saying she was suddenly inexplicably attracted to him, and when I, very flustered, said I saw her as being lesbian, he shrugged and said, well, this is the only man she's attracted to then. 
When I reached level 3, I decided to take the Oathbreaker path. It made sense for how the character had progressed, as she had grown tired of the weight of her oath. Now here somewhere, I know I messed up, and I'm not super proud of it. She killed a dying NPC, hoping to put him out of his misery at the end of a battle, where everyone's spell slots had been spent, and the party's overall hit points were low. The party was immediately up in arms, which is understandable, and decided to attack her over it, to which she attempted to retreat by flying away. The DM then narrated how her god shot her out of the air with a divine arrow, tattering her wings and sending her plummeting to the ground, where a hell mouth opened and demons dragged her into the inferno, never to be seen again. I was of course stunned to see this happen, but I just kind of let it go. I wish that was the end, that I had just moved on, but no, because my next character had it even worse. When I went to make my backup, I rolled abysmally for all his stats, and since I wasn't allowed to re-roll them, I decided to roll with the punches and make a half-orc grave cleric named Festa, who worshipped Thanatos, basically pouring everything into making sure he didn't die immediately. He was a scrawny, undurfed mind worker as a child, and was only 15, which, you know, we were all that age at the time, so the DM allowed it. This is important later. Anyway, I got kidnapped by the party and agreed to join basically out of anxiety. The party immediately hated Festa. He was relentlessly bullied by the other player character for being weak, and they would get mad at him for not healing them in battle. Something a glaive- A glaive cleric? A grave cleric can't do regardless, which I tried to explain in-game. He was constantly the butt of the joke, and I tried to laugh it off, but it got exhausting. Especially since, again, I had rolled for my stats and just got really unlucky. All attempts at roleplay got shut down by people pointing out he was young or the kid. He was just the party's jester, and it got tiring quickly. The party was the least of our issues, too. The DM was worse. I thought making a male character would make the weird harassment from NPC stop, but no. Now he was running into villains called the Grabber and stuff like that, who just straight up constantly tried to kill the party and <clears throat> assault him all the time. When I said I was, you know, kind of uncomfortable with that, the DM said, well, he's legally an adult by half-orc standards, and it's not like they would ever do it successfully. And fantasy is full of dark things and blah 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 blah. That still isn't the end, god I wish it was. Eventually the high school year came to a close and our DM announced he was going on hiatus, but in-game had a god give Festa the keys to the multiverse so that he could level up our characters in other games. And then when we returned, he would come back more powerful to make up for his terrible stats. It was weird, but I thought nothing of it. And when the campaign never came back, I didn't think about it too hard. These things happen. Flash forward to four years later, and I'm talking to a friend from that old group, and he mentions that he's sad I never returned to their table. I was confused and told him I thought that the table just stopped playing altogether. Nope. They had started playing just a month after the hiatus, and the DM conveniently didn't tell me and told all the players I wasn't interested in playing anymore. This absolutely crushed me because... These had been my players once, and for all the gross things, I had actually had a lot of fun with this party, so to know the DM used a magical item to get rid of me, and then lied about me not wanting to come back, it just hurt so bad. It made it difficult to join another table for a very long time. I only recently started playing again, so sorry for how long this is, I just need to get this off my chest. I'm with a wonderful group now, a delightfully ragtag team of thieves, and I'm starting to DM again, but I doubt I'll forget about this betrayal anytime soon. No need to apologize, I got this done in no time at all, it was so easy to read, and very well written, good job. Alright, anyway, writing quality aside, yeah, this sucks. I get it though, you know, you're 15, and you're a lot dumber than you are now, as an adult, at least, I hope so, anyway. You know, you progress, you mature, you age, but that doesn't mean that these actions aren't harmful. I mean, the DM was being extremely creepy, I mean, if I ever, in my entire life, called something the grabber, yeah, you have permission to yeet me into outer space. I feel like the rejection of said creepy behavior is what resulted in the subtle kick, because I don't think he could have convinced everyone else to get rid of you. You know, even though it sucks that you lost this group, I feel like the DM did save you some trouble. I don't think their behavior would have improved and likely would have gotten worse. It really sucks to leave groups behind, to leave friends behind, but at the end of the day, you need friends that treat you right, and if their behavior is hurting you, it's not worth keeping them around, especially if they don't do anything to try and improve themselves. I think this line of reasoning is the exact same line of reasoning that prevents people from leaving groups voluntarily. Don't get me wrong, I get it, but at the same time, these kind of things need to be done.
All right, and that's it for today's episode of RPG Horror Stories. If you guys enjoyed, then please do leave a like. If you want to see more of our content, then you can check out our skit. I recently made a full skit video based on the skits from the series. If you want to check that out, it's linked in the cards. And while you're there, subscribe to Crispy's Tower and get more of our content as it comes out. And finally, if you want to leave your own stories or thoughts, go down in the comments down below. If you can't think of a comment, leave the comment refusing healing to let me know you made it to the end of the video. Hey, by the way, a lot of these stories came out of my email. If you want a chance for your story to get into one of these videos, send them to me. The email is linked in the description down below. But hey, even if you don't have any stories, it necessarily comes subscribe. I will see you all next time. Farewell.